your dad to come to St. Louis. And she says, you know, I think I'm going to try to talk him into going there. And he, and he came to St. Louis with Tommy yeah. Ice and did a prophecy conference. And the neat thing about it was so many people came up and said, I can't remember the last time we went, we had a prophecy conference in St. Louis. And it was a real blessing. This is Tim Lahane's last book, Target Israel, written along with his very, very close friend, Ed Heinzen, who used to minister in St. Louis. So this is a very good book, Target Israel. And uh, Israel's a target. You know why Israel's a target? Well, who are they target? Who, who, who are they? Who's, who's aiming the, uh, the, 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 the gun at Israel is Satan. Satan wants to destroy Israel because God chose them. So Israel is a target. And this book goes through a lot of that. This is a book, this is kind of an unusual book written by a Jewish believer on Bible prophecy called Future Hope. David Brickner, he heads up Jews for Jesus, a oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. long-standing uh, Jewish mission started in the early 70s when a lot of Jewish people were getting saved at that time. So these are two books that I have not mentioned yet as well. Uh, please take a brochure. It will give you a bird's eye view of what we're all about and how you could uh, learn more about us. And also thank you for those of you who uh, are signing up for our newsletter. Uh, that is a, a, a great uh, appreciation. We really, really do appreciate that. Well, I want to talk about, when I talk about a judgment, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. Sometimes it's called the bima seat of Christ. And we'll talk about what that is. Uh, uh, you want to be on the bima. If, if you are uh, an Olympic participant, you want to be on the bima. Because that means you're going to get a medal. And so believers are going to be at the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to talk about that. But before we do, let's ask God to bless our time. Heavenly Father, we just want to commit this time to you and ask that you'll help this wonderful truth to be made clear. I pray, Father, that you'll uh, enlighten us concerning this event, to see the potential uh, of how we do things here and now that will affect what happens at this judgment. Please uh, help it to be made clear so we can understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, <clears throat> when you told me we had an hour that I have an hour. I didn't look at my watch to see when that oh, hour began. Oh, sorry. Uh, go, uh, uh, let's see, 1045. 1045. Yes, Excellent. Sir. Okay. This judgment, unlike the great white throne judgment, which is only for unbelievers, this judgment is only for believers. Nobody who is lost will be at the judgment seat of Christ. And it's called the Bema Seat of Christ because essentially it's a time when the church saints will receive their rewards. Now, rewards, that's a subject in and of itself. I've had people tell me, well, ah, you know what, I'm not too interested in rewards. I don't care if I have any rewards. Really. The only reason why you wouldn't have rewards is because you did nothing for the Lord after you were saved. Yeah. Now, who wants to put it that way? Who wants to say, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't care if I do anything in service for the Lord. The Lord wants us to serve him. Yeah. And he will bless us in turn when we stand at this particular judgment. So this is a positive thing. It's when the church saints. Now, when you say church saints, well, what about the Old Testament saints? What about the millennial saints? What about the tribulation saints? They're going to have a time when they also will have a judgment. They're just not clearly laid out in Scripture for us, but we know that all believers of all time are going to receive rewards for service rendered to the Lord in a certain way. And Paul makes it extremely clear how you do things in order to receive a reward and how you do things that's going to cause you to forfeit receiving a reward. 
And again, here's the whole beauty of it. These, and we're gonna see this as we go on. The, re the rewards that we receive are gonna be uh, issued to us via crowns. And we're not gonna walk around do a, doing a balancing act in heaven with all these crowns. I got 12 crowns on my hand, whoa, whoa. You know, like they're gonna fall off. No, these crowns are gonna be what? Cast back at the feet of the Lord Jesus. That's the beauty of it. The only reason why we receive a reward is because of who God is and how we make ourselves available and to do things for his glory and then we'll receive a reward. But we're, I, I mean, look, I, I remember when I was a kid and I was playing baseball, hardball, and back then you had to win games to get a trophy. You, know, you understand that concept? Yeah. <laughs> you understand that? It's kind of uh, gone now. Every, everybody, you could, you could be uh, 0 and 12 and get the same trophy as a team that gets 12 and 0. Something wrong with that, I think. Yeah. Something wrong with that. That's not the way it's gonna be at the beam. There are gonna be different degrees of rewards based upon service render. But I remember when you know, I was on a baseball team, we were on a baseball <coughs> team, and so I had all these trophies, and my mom and dad used to show them on their mantle. And after a while, I said, you know, you gotta get rid of those things. I haven't played baseball in 20 years. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, just <laughs> get, get rid of them. So, uh, no, they kept them up there because what, it was a reminder. Right. It was a reminder. By the way, in the book of Ephesians, it tells us that we, every true believer is gonna be a trophy of God's grace. Amen. That's what Paul says. Paul says, right. believers are going to be a trophy of, we're going to be in heaven, and we're going to, brother, I haven't seen you for a while, grace. I haven't seen you for a while, grace. Grace is just going to be overflowing in heaven because we are going to be trophies of God's grace. <laughs> well, rewards, is, it's nothing more than a manifestation of service rightly offered to the Lord. So it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. The key verse, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 11. This is probably one of the clearest passages on this particular subject. There are other passages that state clearly that we will stand before the judgment seat of God and so forth. And again, for a believer, that's not a fearful thing. There, there, there may be some, uh, there, there's two, two ideas about the beam seat of Christ for believers. There might be those who have a little bit of remorse, wishing they would have done more. Or there are those who believe that there'll be no remorse whatsoever. At least we're going to get something. So you decide which one you want to believe because it's not clearly stated, I don't think, uh, in, in Scripture. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11 to 15, it says, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? In order to be before the, the beam of seat of Christ, you've got to be a believer. You have to be standing on the foundation of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You have to be saved. No one, no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid. It was laid for us. Christ is a foundation. We don't lay our own foundation of good works. I'm building upon the foundation of good works. There is no foundation. That's the whole point. Yeah. Anything that a person did prior to, herself, prior to salvation... Sorry, it doesn't count. It's only once a person is a believer that what we can do for the glory and honor of God can make a difference at this judgment. <clears throat> it says, no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation, so you have to be on the foundation, which means you have to be saved. And here are six materials that our service will render out as. Some of our service is gonna be gold. Some of our service is gonna be silver or precious stones. Some of our service is gonna be wood hand straw. You see the difference in the value? You got all the way from gold all the way down to straw, which is 
meaningless unless you feed horses and cattle. And it means a lot there. But in, in, in the economy of rewards, doesn't mean a thing. Each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it's to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality, quality, not the quantity, the quality of each man's work. What's the quality? And if it's the right kind of service rendered in a certain way, it'll, it'll result in gold, silver, and precious stones because gold, silver, and precious stones survive fire. In fact, gold is purified by, by fire. Silver is purified by fire. But on the other hand, wood, hand, straw burn up. They're gone. You put those in fire, they're, they're consumed. Now, if any man's work, if any man's work, which he has built on it, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, remains, he'll receive a reward. So the only three, only three out of the six are going to produce a reward. Gold, silver, and precious stones. Wood, hay, and stubble is going to be built, uh, will be burned up. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss of reward, but he himself will be saved. He doesn't lose salvation. You see, he's already in heaven. He's, you can't lose your salvation when you're already in heaven. He's already in heaven, but he's losing rewards because of the way in which they were offered. He will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, I mean, the major question is this. How do you build on the foundation of Christ in such a way that it results in gold, silver, and precious stones? How do you do that? How do you keep away? from building with wood, hand, straw. Isn't that the issue? I mean, that is the issue. And we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna try to answer that, that question because, you know, if, if, you, if you wanna serve the Lord, you wanna do it right, don't you? Yeah. I mean, if we're gonna serve the Lord, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just kinda of humble. If my wheelbarrow is empty, I'm fine with that. Really. The only reason why your wheelbarrow is going to be empty is because you didn't do a thing for the glory of God. Right. Now that's what it boils down to. This is not a pride issue. In fact, if you're proud about your rewards, you're building with wood, hand, straw. Right. Do you understand that point? You can't be, look at all these rewards I got. Whoa, man, I need to build another barn. <laughs> More rewards. No, no. We got the wrong focus. We have the wrong focus. So we're going to hopefully clarify some of those things. So who's going to be judged? Who, who's going to be at the Bema Seat of Christ? Not Old Testament saints. This is, a, this is a judgment which is unique only for believers who are saved from the day of Pentecost until the rapture. Now, the day of Pentecost, what began on the day of Pentecost? The church and and what happens at the rapture the, ra the church is raptured up so this judgment is only for those who were born again between the day of Pentecost and the rapture and that's everybody in this room because we're still in that time period we're no longer still back at the day of Pentecost we've we've progressed but we haven't you know, the rapture hasn't happened yet so from Acts 2 to 1 Thessalonians 4, that's the only saints who will be there. This And, and this would include all of us here who are saved, living during the church age. The Apostle Paul said a, a very important verse in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, where Paul is talking to church saints, and he says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now just analyze that verse for a second. A church saint, a believer, a true believer has the option, has the possibility of doing things which are good or bad. Now, and again, this is not necessarily talking about sin because no sin is gonna receive any kind of reward. 
We're talking about things of service. Some of them can be good. Some of them will be characterized as bad. Sinful only in the sense because of the motives that they were done in were wrong. But the, the actions themselves. You could be helping people that really, really need help. That's not a sin. But you could do it in such a way that, yeah. look at me. Yeah. Oh, by the way, did you know that I was over visiting so-and-so? And, and I, I was over there cutting their lawn because they can't cut their lawn. If, you, if that's all you're worried about is the applause of people, what you've done for that person is not a sin, but what you're doing is sinning because of you're looking for people. Oh, oh, you, oh, you are so nice. Well, you know, a Jewish people, a Jewish person would you do, use a Yiddish word. You're such a mensch. Has anybody heard that? <laughs> mensch. You're such a mensch. Well, that's not why we do things. So people will pat us on the back and tell us, you know, how great we are. And always be careful about that. Anytime we do something for the Lord, certainly people are going to, it's okay to say thank you if somebody does something for you and helps you out. But the, the, the key, the key is that they want to do it because they love the Lord. Amen. And let people exercise their gifts. You exercise your gifts and do so for the glory of God and let other people exercise their gifts. And sometimes people exercising their gifts will help you out. And sometimes you'll be exercising your gifts and you'll be helping others out. Yeah. But there are some people that won't let anybody do anything for them. Yeah. What's that all about? That's pride. Yeah. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. Don't need help from anybody else. Let people serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs> the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints will be judged at the end of the tribulation period in preparation for entrance into the millennial kingdom. That's when the Old Testament saints are going to be taken care of. And that's when the tribulation saints will be taken care of. Remember, there's going to be judgments to determine who enters into the millennial kingdom. And they, again, we're connecting dots here because every believer has to be judged in some way to receive these kinds of rewards. So that's who's, every single, it says in, let's see, that, that second Corinthians 5.10, and again, this is for, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but all believers are going to stand before God's judgment seat in some form or fashion. It's just that this particular one, which is taking place in heaven during the seven years, while the earth is going through the tribulation period, we are going through, there are two things, two things that happen in heaven for church saints while the tribulation period is going on. One is the judgment seat of Christ. One is the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we don't have time to, to talk about. But that's the other thing. By the way, those books mention all of this. Those books, that's why those books are so valuable, because they go in more detail. And they mention everything that we don't have time to mention. So um, when, when, when are we going to be judged? Turn, and I want you to see this with your own eyes. In Revelation 19, turn to Revelation 19. The answer to this question is given in Revelation 19 and verse 8 as to when will we be judged. Revelation 19, it, it, it indicates that when the Lord Jesus returns in glory to put the tribulation period to an end, the church saints will have already received their rewards. So that kind of gives us a pinpoint that if, if when Jesus returns, and we've already received our rewards, that means it had to take place in heaven. Yeah. It had to take place in heaven while the tribulation period is going on on the earth. Believers, uh, the church saints, are judged. Look what it says in Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, who's the bride? Church. The bride has made herself ready. It was given to her, the bride, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen, what's this fine linen all about? It's the righteous acts 
of the church saints, of the yeah. saints. What righteous acts? The righteous acts that we did while we were alive down here wanting to serve the Lord. So these righteous acts, are these acts, some of them are righteous, some of them are wood, hand, stubble. The ones that are righteous and survive, the gold, silver, and precious stones, this is what it's going to turn into. Fine linen, bright and clean. That will be a manifestation of the, of, of the works that we did that were put through the fire, and the six elements, out of the six elements, three are going to survive the fire, and that's the gold, silver, precious stones. That still doesn't answer the question, what do we have to do to build the gold, silver, and precious stones? We're going to get to that in just a little bit. So, this righteousness is that which we do that brings glory and honor to the Lord. Right after this, right after this, according to Revelation 19, 11 through 16, which I want us to take a look at, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, that's where the Lord Jesus returns to earth, and we will be coming back with him already judged. So we went to heaven, and we weren't judged while we were here on earth. You understand that? This judgment, we don't go to heaven with our rewards. We go to heaven to get judged and receive our rewards, and then when we return, we return with him already glorified. Notice Revelation 19, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. This, of course, is the return of the Lord Jesus to the earth. He who sat upon is called faithful and true and is righteous. He judges and wages war, and his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems, and he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. So what's his name? Don't let anybody tell you what his name is. No, no one knows. But some people will tell you what his name is. Trust me. <laughs> you can probably find out on the internet. Everything's there, right? <laughs> well, no one knows about himself. And he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in look fine linen and clean were following him on white horses. Who's that? There you go. And from his mouth comes a short, sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod and iron. He treads the winepress and the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe, on his thigh, he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But did you notice the point of it, we're coming back with this fine linen clothed in Amen. white, bright linen, which is a manifestation that we've already gone through the judgment and the re rewards that we're going to receive, we've already received them. So let's ask where, where is this, where's this judgment going to take place? Where will the judgment of the seat, uh, the being the seat of Christ take place? Well, uh, it, it tells us that basically it's going to take place in heaven. Um, when the Lord Jesus raptures the church, he doesn't rapture us and then come right back to earth. It's not like we go up, we come right back down. That's post-tribulation rapture. No, we are raptured. We stay up there for seven years while the tribulation period is going on. And, and that's when we are, are going to be judged. Now, the place that we're going to be judged is in heaven while the tribulation period is going on. The Bema seat uh, will take place in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Now, that's the key. The Bema seat is going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus, we know that because he's the judge. All judgment has been given to who? From the Father to the Lord Jesus. So when we are raptured up, it says we will forevermore be with him. So wherever Jesus is, the church is. Do you understand that principle? Yeah. That is so important. From the time we're raptured, we will never be apart from the Lord Jesus. Amen. We will forevermore be with him. So he comes to, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm going to just read a couple of passages to you. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ, those who have died uh, in, in Christ during the church age, will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus in the air, and then listen to this, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. So when the Lord Jesus raptures the church, where does he come to? To the clouds. Once the rapture takes place, in, in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, then he goes back to heaven. Who's with him? The church. The church. That's where the judgment is going to take place. The, judge, the Lord Jesus is the judge. He goes back to heaven, and that's where the judgment is going to take place. Now, why will we be judged? Why will we be judged? This, and this is very important. This is a really important part to consider. This, this judgment is not to determine one's eternal destiny. That's already determined. We're in heaven. Yeah. We're, we're already in heaven when this judgment takes place. Only those who are sick, by the way, that's another reason why I believe in a pre-trib rapture. Because how do we get up there if we're not raptured? How, if we're staying down here during the tribulation period or any part of it, how are we to be judged? Amen. Only those who are saved are present. The church age, from within the church age, are present. So one's destiny is not the issue. That's not the issue. And if that's not the issue, what is? The primary reason for the judgment is given to us in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each man may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So basically what Paul is saying is that all of the works, all of the works which are done in the lifetime of each individual believer, and by the way, you say, boy, you know, I, I have some really close friends who are really, really, really great believers. I'm sure glad they're my friends. I think I'll ride on their coattail. There's no coattail to ride on. This is something we, that we do as an individual. Sometimes think that things, I remember being on an airplane once and I was flying to, to, to speak in a church. So I got into a conversation with the guy next to me. He goes, uh, so I asked him what he did. And, and he asked me what I did. And I told him, I said, in fact, I'm going to speak in a church. He goes, wow, well, I'm glad you're on the plane. <laughs> like, <laughs> I said, what is that? What, what is my being on a plane have to do with our safety? Nothing. <laughs> think about the pilot. And now I think about the mechanics that work on the planes because our son does that. Literally, I pray for the mechanics that work on the planes Amen. I fly on. Amen. You want them to be good, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I got news for you. The Bema Seat of Christ, and to make that silly point, the Bema Seat of Christ, it's an individual judgment Right. What somebody else does has no bearing upon us right. in a positive way or in a negative way. It's us with the Lord. Basically what Paul is saying is, is that all of the works which are done in the lifetime of each individual believer will be viewed and judged by the Lord Jesus to determine their worthiness in, in order to receive or lose rewards. What is the issue? Bottom line, 1 Corinthians 4, 2, listen to what it says. In this case, moreover, it is required of a steward. And by the way, we are all stewards. Every true believer is a steward. We were given something by God to take care of and to utilize. The main requirement of a steward is to be found trustworthy and faithful. Amen. The question is, remember the, the parable of the stewards? They're all given a little money. One goes out and invests it and makes more. Another one goes out and invests, invests it, makes a little bit less, but he still makes something. The other one buries it. Who, who was the one that did wrong? The one who buried it. Well, when you bury something and you dig it up, it's the same as it was when you buried it. 
you know, I'm, I mean, it's, it's obvious that we, we, we don't want to bury that which God gave us to use in serving him. Right. You know, I mean, we, 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 I, I've heard this. I, there was this one individual in our church, in one, one of the churches I was in in Kansas City, and he would boast how little he knew about the Bible. He used that as a form of, you see how humble I am? I just, I just don't know much about the Bible. And we all agreed. We, we, we agree with him. <laughs> but that is, that is nothing to be proud about. Amen. You want to know things about the Bible. You, you, you want to know how it is that God uh, equipped you. Every believer has been equipped to do something. Yes. Yes. Now, there are some things I can't do. Because I haven't been equipped to do that. And, and if I try to do those things that I'm not equipped to do, I'm not going to do a very good job. Now, Paul told Timothy, although Timothy didn't have the major gift of evangelism, he was a very timid, shy guy to do the, do the work of an evangelist. Now, we are all supposed to do certain things. Even though we don't have the primary gift, we're all supposed to let people know that they have a need for the Lord Jesus. Something, I have a friend who has the gift of evangelism. I have a friend who has that gift. And when I was in Kansas City, we used to go out once a week, cold turkey, to a, to a park, and, and witness to people. And it was a pleasure to, to watch this guy. How the Lord, he had the gift. I don't think I have the gift, but I do it. And I love doing it. But it's wonderful to see, to, to see when people are exercising their gifts. Amen. Amen. And, and, and there are things that, that people can do much better than Brother Wes and myself, even though we're, quote, in the ministry, because you've got different gifts than what we have. That's right. The yeah. key is, well, you know, my gift, my gift is behind the scenes. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know what? You're, and by the way, the church is, is symbolized by a body. Mm -hmm. Do you know you got things in your body that you never see? You don't want to see your bones. The only time you'll see your bone is if it comes out your leg, if you break your leg. You don't want to see that bone. But how would we do without bones? We want to survive. We have, we have inner organs that we don't see. But we wouldn't live without inner organs. That's the way some believers are. Some believers are behind the scenes more. Their ministries are, quote, invisible. But boy, are they effective. And they're necessary. Amen. Some of us we have the opportunity we are seen and heard more and we need to be more careful <laughs> because some people will stand at the door and tell us things that sometimes can go to our head if we're not careful you know it's nice to compliment you and you understand that but just let the person know how much the Lord has blessed you through their ministry it's the Lord it's the Lord Amen. we're Amen. nothing more than a tool in the hands of God Amen. It's like if a hammer and a saw uh, came to life and they said, wow, look at this beautiful building that we're building. No, they're not building it. It's the carpenter who's using them as tools that are building it. Amen. And right. the Lord is the carpenter. Mm -hmm. we're, right. just a, we're just a tool. Amen. But you say, well, wait a minute. You know, I've lived in this little town all my life. I haven't traveled. I haven't been able to be exposed the way you guys are exposed. And I like to give this illustration. So I have this ring right here. And how many degrees are in this ring? 360. 300, 360. 360 degrees are in this ring. Now, how many degrees are in the planet Earth? How many? 360. 360? The same amount. The same amount of the degrees are on the earth, the circle of the earth, as are on the circle of this ring. Well, if my ministry is comprised of this size circle, it's like 360 degrees. But if your ministry is comprised of the planet earth, guess what it still has? 360 degrees. Do you, you get the point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some people who travel the earth. Billy Graham traveled the earth. Who's going to catch up with him? That's not the point. But 
We've got the same amount of degrees in our sphere of ministry that he had in his. Amen. Amen. You understand that? <clears throat> to me, that's encouraging. I'll never do the travel that some of these people do. I don't have to do the travel. Right. I just have to be faithful in the sphere of the circle Amen. that God has placed me Amen. in. Amen. And everybody's placed in a circle who's a believer. Amen. And you have the same amount of degrees as anybody else that you could see on TV. David Jeremiah, Charles Stanley, John MacArthur, the whole bit. They travel the world. We travel in a smaller circle, but it's still 360 degrees. So basically what I believe the Word of God is teaching, if we're faithful in the sphere that God has placed us, we're not going to come up shortchanged <laughs> when it comes to rewards. Amen. The key is us. What are we doing in that 360 degrees? Amen. That's oh. the issue. Yeah. That's the issue. And now we get to the most important part, the results of the judgment. How do we build with things that are going to be judged that don't get consumed by the fire? How do we do that? I wanted to know that. If, look, if we're going to use our time, we might as well be using it wisely and faithfully, don't you think? Amen. So the results of the judgment are clearly laid out in Scripture. All believers' works will be judged, and the end result will be reward, res, res, rewards given for faithful service that is done to the glory of God. And that's, and that's the key. The key is, why am I doing what I'm doing? Well, I did this today. Well, I'll give you another illustration. Uh, I used to, in the first church I was in in Kansas City, I was the head of organizing vacation Bible school. Now, to me, that's the closest thing, if there is a purgatory, <laughs> that there is. There is no such thing as purgatory, but organizing VBS comes close. <laughs> you know, you put in the bulletin, we need workers for VBS, and nobody is saying a word. And we're getting closer and closer. So I say, I said to the senior pastor, maybe I ought to get up from the pulpit and just mention it. And so I mentioned it, and the people, well, why didn't you mention it before? I said, well, it's only been in the bulletin for the last two months. <laughs> so we get these workers, and so VBS is over, and I made the mistake of all mistakes. I listed the people that worked in the VBS, and I forgot one. Oh. Now, how did I know I forgot one? <laughs> that person, get out of my way, i got to talk to him. And they came up to me and said, do you know what you did? And I said, I think I have an idea. <laughs> I'll never serve in VBS again. That's what they told me. And I didn't tell them what I thought. I thought, well, you shouldn't have done it in the first place if that's why you did it. Mm. Yeah. I'm sorry that your name was missed. That was very unintentional. And I never name names again. I, I learned my lesson. Amen. I'll just say thank, thank all of you that served in VBS. That covers the whole board. Right. But that's not the way you want to serve. Right. That that manifests itself. And this was a very dear person. And I don't think all of her service was that was done that way. But it, it certainly hit a nerve. And that's one of the things that we want to avoid. If we do something. If we serve the Lord and, and, and somebody doesn't, quote, applaud what we do, so the light is shining real hot and heavy on us, and we're sweating because the light is focused on we don't worry about that. Amen. We just don't worry about that. If, if any man's work which he has built remains on the foundation, remains, he's going to receive a reward. So here's the bottom line, and this is really, I don't think it's really any surprise Works that are done for self-glorification. We do it so people will recognize us. We, we do it so, so people will notice us. I believe that those are works that are going to suffer loss of reward. We, we, we want the Lord Jesus to be the one recognized right. for service from any of us. And for all of us, it's not, it's not us, it's the Lord. In all honesty, and I think, Pastor, you might agree with me, you know how sometimes we stand at the back of the door, that was a good sermon, Pastor. Boy, that was a good sermon. And some people will look you right in the eyes 
and they'll use different terminology, and you know the Lord used it. I remember one pastor saying, he goes, you know how I view people? They come in to our church with a thimble, and they want their thimble filled up with uh, Bible truth. Everything that they feel they need to know will fit in a thimble. And they walk out, and they, tr and they stumble on a step, and half of what's in their thumb thimble falls out. So they're not there for, they're there for other motives. And a person can be behind the pulpit and be teaching, if Antichrist gave a sermon, I guarantee you there'd be people with back, hey, that was a great sermon, great job, boy. Even though it was all lies and false teaching because there's a lack. We live in a day of lack of discernment. Yes. We, we, we are living in days of, of Big lack of discernment. So we need to have a discerning ear, and we need to do self-examination as to why we do things that we do. Amen. It's clearly stated that the believer will not lose their salvation, but we will. Have, we do have the potential of losing rewards because of doing things with the wrong motives. The bottom line is the motive. What is the motive? Why are we doing what we're doing? I want to hurry up and finish this. Faithful rewards will be received as crowns. There are five crowns that are spelled out in the New Testament. The incorruptible crown, the crown of life, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, and the crown of glory. All of those are listed. 1 Corinthians 9.25, James 1.12, 1 Thessalonians 2.19, 2 Timothy 4.8, 1 Peter 5.4. So the word for crown in each of these passages is the Greek word Stephanos. It, it, it really meant the victory wreath given to one who was victorious in the Olympics. You know what that you know what that was? It was a wreath of leaves. Mm -hmm. Now, when we were kids, we used to make these out of weeds. You weave them together and you put them around your neck, and it was something you did when you were in elementary school in the 50s. So, uh, you know what happened to those little things that you, we weave? Well, we, we, we tore them up out of them from their roots. They died. They wilted. So all that work that was involved was wasted. Could you imagine training as an Olympian and receiving a wreath of leaves? And they're going to be dead in a couple of days? But they thought that was big. I mean, when you're an Olympian, you want to be one of three, don't you? At least the, the, the current Olympics. Yeah. That's, you could have 10 people in the race, but only three are going to be up on the BEMA. You wanted to be up on the BEMA and receiving a reward. That's why each, each of us would hope that we would be triumphant in, 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 in the games, not the Olympic games, but in the, in, in the service of the Lord. Amen. That's what it boils yeah. down to. Amen. Do you, do you know, you, and you have to know where your good, where your gifts lie in order to be effective in your service. And I, 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 I meet a lot of believers that they'll, they'll tell me, I don't know what my gifts are. And I just say, well, what do you really like doing? Envision what you would like to do within the body of Christ. And a lot of people have this idea, well, if I'm doing the will of God, I gotta hate what I'm doing. No, <laughs> not at all. Yeah, yeah. If, if I give myself to the Lord, I'm going to uh, some, strange place on the planet I don't want to go no if you're called that's where you want to go that's where yeah. you'll be the happiest yeah. and the most blessed doing the will of God is doing something that we really like to do and I can remember this so vividly I was in Joplin Missouri speaking at a church I was staying with this family and uh, the, the, the father said to me hey come and take a ride I need to run at the grocery store and he took his little son with him. He must have been maybe eight years old. And so we're driving and um, he says he says to me, uh, uh, Mr. Marty, do you, do you like being a missionary? So I thought, well, that's a great opportunity <coughs> to either how, to tell him how great being a missionary is or talk to him with sour grapes. Being a missionary, try to avoid it like the plague. <laughs> now, if I would say something like that, you know, that would not be understood. And the, I think the father would say, well, what are you being one for? Mm -hmm. No, you want to you say, this is wonderful. I love yeah. doing what I do. 
this, this is what the Lord equipped me to do. He may, he, he may have something different for you as you grow older, and you know, when, when you, you have made a profession, and as you grow older, you learn what you can do for the Lord. You just want to do it and do it wholeheartedly for the glory of God. Amen. And and if you do that, certainly there are going to be some things that we do that are going to wind up as wood hand stuff. But hopefully the majority will be gold, silver, and precious stones because they were done for the right reason. Amen. Now let me ask you in closing. Are you, not the person sitting next to you, not the person that, oh, I wish so-and-so was here. They really need this. <laughs> no. <laughs> you. Are you going to be at the judgment seat of Christ? Only believers will be there. Only believers who are believers now. Well, I'll wait till after I die and I'll make the decision. You don't make any decision after you're dead. Yeah. The decision's yeah. made for you. That's right. You make that. You understand your need now to be reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus because of what he accomplished on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection. If you haven't done that, talk to Brother Wes. Talk to somebody else who could sit down with you with the Bible and explain the importance of that to you. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you will help us to realize that this is a wonderful truth that will happen. It's in your word. We thank you for it. Pray you'll bless this truth to us and help, help those of us that want to serve you to do it in a way that it will bring forth gold, silver, and precious stones so you could receive the crowns that you, Lord Jesus, are worthy of. And we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.